hope you're hungry because you're listening to Everybody Eats. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Everybody Eats podcast. I hope you guys are having a great week. We have a great episode for you guys today. We're here joined by Mr. Chester Hall. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we have Eden XP on the line. So before we start, I want to make sure um, that you're following us on all platforms, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're on all those platforms. So make sure you like, subscribe, share with your friends. Um, on Instagram, I want to thank you for all of, uh, the new followers and support that we've been having. And obviously, I want you guys to stay safe and healthy during these times. If you are on uh, the IG Live, shout out to you. Thank you guys for joining. So you guys, if you're on the IG Live, again, a little sneak peek of the episode before it comes out in a few weeks. So um, shout out, shout out to all you guys. All right. So let's get into today's episode. So Mr. Chester Hall, if you could introduce yourself, who you are, where you from, and then we can get this rolling. Cool. Well, cool. First of all, thank you guys for having me on. Um, my name is Chester Hall. Once again, I am a uh, assistant principal that works in Newport News at a school's a trade school called New Horizons Regional Education Centers. Um, I'm an assistant principal there. It's my first year there, but um, I'm also from the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And if you're not for sure where that's at, uh, there's that little spot that hangs off the bottom of Maryland that nobody really knows about unless they're on their way traveling to Jersey or New York and it cuts about three hours off their time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much, you know, who I am and where I'm from. Got it. Got it. All right. So. Um, I know we had a call the other day and we kind of discussed a little bit about your background. Um, so the first thing uh, I wanted to cover was that you said that you're um, an assistant principal now, right? So um, how did you get into the education space and like what was that journey like? Uh, it was really crazy actually. Um, first of all, my, uh, my family, I come from a family of educators. So my mother's an educator, uh, my father's in education, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins. Um, so it was almost kind of predetermined that I was going to be in education before I even, you know, partook in that journey. And, uh, I actually went to school and I wanted to study computer science. Mm. So I actually went to Hampton university right up the street. I mean, like I said, I'm here in Newport news. And, um, when I left from Hampton University, or when I got there, I didn't want to do computer programming. I, I wanted to program video games. I uh, spent my first uh, program sitting in front of a computer for about 16 hours, hmm. trying to figure out you know, how I was going to make something work. And I was searching for about 16 hours for a little semicolon that was out of place. So I was more of a social person, yeah. so I quickly transitioned very quickly um, to marketing, should I say, or business marketing. Uh, that was what my then girlfriend, now wife, she was studying in marketing, and I said, okay, I've always been pretty creative, let me try that out, and did that, got a degree in marketing, and came out of school, first job was as a grocery store manager at a Kroger in Charlottesville, and did that for a year, didn't know how much people really cared about their dog food mm -hmm. until I started working there, um, after that, I said, you know, I've not always been working with youth or kids. So my mother said, you know, why don't you drive one into the classroom? So I did some long-term subbing, uh, really liked it. The teachers liked me there. The principals liked me there. They said, you know, you probably have a good future in education. Typical line that most administrators would say, mm -hmm. young black male. <laughs> they want as many young black males in the classroom as possible. So with that, I said, okay, well, let me try it out. I went, did the praxis, passed it. And uh, did my first uh, year in education was a sixth grade math and science class. And uh, that was in 2002. And new, fresh off the boat, you know, I got the worst of the worst. And I actually fell in love with the profession and I fell in love with the kids. So therefore, you know, the rest is history. I never looked back after that. So this is uh, about 17 years later, I'm in education. Got it, got it. That's a lot, that's a lot. Ian, what are you going to say? Question? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, you, you know, your comment about um, being young black male in the classroom, uh, I guess looking back on that, do you have any, like, is your perspective different? Because it sounded like you were kind of hesitant and resistant towards it at first. <laughs> so looking back at, you know, after you fell in love with it, looking back, like, what's your take on having more, you know, young black males in the classroom? Like, would you, would you say after your 17 years, would you be the same person to go tell another, um, you know, a young black male, hey, you should, you know, you have a, possibly have a great future in this. 
Um, completely, completely. I mean, my feelings have never changed. The main thing I would say is that if you're going to go into it, go into it for the love, um, because you're not going to make a lot of money. I mean, that's pretty typical of any you know profession in the education field is that you're not going to make a lot of money uh, first year. You're not going to make a lot of money even you know ten years down the road. So. If you go into it for the love of the kids, the love of the subject matter that you're teaching, and the love of the profession, you'll be perfectly fine. I, I will say, you know, as I grew and I went up the, uh, I could say corporate ladder, the education ladder, the paychecks did get a lot better. Um, so right now, you know, I've been as far as being at the central office level. Um, I was a coordinator of student services in my former division and did that for about three years. And the paychecks look pretty good. Um, so, you know, in order to get over here with my wife, because she was in uh, Newport News working, and I wanted to be over here with my wife and my son, so therefore I stepped down from that position and went into another. But I'll tell anybody, and my mother used to tell me this all the time, if you're a young black male in education, you can pretty much write your ticket anywhere you want to go in the, in the nation. And it's still true today, you know, because I know for a fact that you'll probably get picked up, you know, two to three times quicker than somebody else that's coming out of college that may look fairly typical to what uh, a classroom teacher would look like. But at the same time, once again, if you go into it, you got to make sure you go into it for the right reasons. Got it. Would you say that that's because um, there's less, uh, you would say, young black men in education, that's why you get picked up faster? Yes and no. Um, I got picked up because I was very familiar with who the administrators were yeah. in the division. Um, I, like I said, I went back to my hometown, so all the administrators that were there, you know, I probably went to school with their kids, or I played on the kids' soccer team, or their football team, or so they knew who I was already. Yeah. Um, so that helped out a great deal. But um, when I came on in 2002, I could probably count on one hand how many black and um, black educators that were in our division. Um, and we probably had maybe about 52 to 5,300 students. It was a small division, yeah. nonetheless. But I could count on one hand how many uh, educators we had in the classroom that looked like me um, at that time. Got it, got it. Yeah, so um, I know when we had the phone call, I said I kind of resonated with your story of teaching because I come from a family of educators as well. Father, uncles, cousins, aunts, like grandparents, like they teach us all around. And it was never really anything that I really thought about um, growing up. It was more of like, no, don't be a teacher, don't be a teacher. <laughs> so it was definitely like, you know, like I always respected teachers, obviously, right? But I was like, okay, that's just not something I'm gonna do. Um, and um, you know, fast forward going through college, it wasn't really until maybe like, you know, my junior, senior year. And I'm like, hey, you know what I mean? Like teaching, like I, I enjoy teaching, but maybe not in like a classroom setting, you know? And then that kind of, um, that was, that happened a lot through NABA, uh, National Association of Black Accountants, the organization that Edom and I are in. Um, we were always teaching or, or bring, we were always hosting events and a lot of times like teaching students about professional development, resume writing and things like that. So. It, it was it was education right but um and not necessarily in a you know a typical classroom setting and then that kind of is what stemmed the podcast because i was like hey you know i love you know putting this on like this right here is a form of teaching right now you know so even though it's a podcast episode helping people you know it may be even though, yes, we're business and entrepreneur related, but we also pro career, right? So maybe, you know, you were interested in getting a career in education administration. These are tips and things that you can learn. So, right, you know, this is, this is teaching, teaching people. And, you know, you could say that this has a greater reach because you're not limited to certain people in a classroom. So, you know, teaching comes in, teaching comes in many different forms. Um, so I, I definitely, I definitely respect that. So, um, and I... In another world, you would have been a guidance counselor. I was thinking about that today. <laughs> I was actually thinking about that today because I was like, yeah, I don't think I could be with the cla in a classroom. And I was like, you know what? Maybe a guidance counselor, you know, would have been a pretty cool um, idea. Because that, um, I was thinking that also because I wanted to ask you what advice, I, may, I kind of want to save this question until later, but the, just okay. the background question would be what advice would you give to um, current current students that you're either... You said you started off with like sixth grade, right? Teaching sixth grade. So what advice would you give sixth graders today to help prep them for the future? So we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that a little bit later, probably for the last segment. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll save that. Um, but two other things that you've done along your journey. You said that um, you've written books and you are a life coach. So um, what 
all your books? How did that How did that start? Where did that you know come from? Okay, uh, it's crazy because I didn't. I completely forgot that I was going to bring those up here, and I didn't, so I don't have them up here to show. But yeah. you know, I'll you know talk about it. So, Definitely. um, so interesting that you bring that up as far as being a guidance counselor because when I went to go get my master's degree, that was kind of the, you know, I was trying to determine what direction I was going to, going to go into. Um, did I want to go into education administration or did I want to go into guidance counseling? And I, it's interesting because I've always seen myself going in more to counseling mm. than I was education administration. I always say, I'm not going to be that principal. I'm not going to be that guy or that woman. So, you know, guidance counseling was really kind of my, my avenue I want to go into, but I started looking at the earning potential and that kind of swayed me from mm. there because guys counselors are still classified as teachers once they're said and done. Um, they're classified as teachers opposed to being an administrator. You can actually go up to the central office level. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so that was a, a major thing for me. The aspect of writing the books, um, well, the first book that I wrote was called The Massive Action Plan. It's called The Map. Um, and that was a a spinoff of me being a life coach. Um, I was an academic, or I still am an academic life coach. Um, and what I did with that is I wanted to, once again, and teach students or teach kids that didn't have any parameters as far as a, a high stakes test. And in Virginia, they're called SOLs. Okay. So, and I wanted to get away from that, should I say. Um, so that was kind of my avenue to actually do that was to become an academic life coach, which helps students at home as well as in their school and their studies. Um, so with that, um, I became a life coach and moved in that direction. And I was coming across a lot of students that not only did they have some things that they had to deal with deep down, but it was also the day-to-day -day life or the day-to-day -day interactions with their parents. And their parents also had things that were going wrong. So what I ended up doing is I created the book, um, which is an extension of my coaching plan. And it's just seven steps. And ultimately what, it ended, what they end up doing is helping you, you know, matriculate to a better life than where you are right now. Um, that looks different for a lot of different people. Yeah. Um, so by the time you get through it, you should be further along than where you were initially in your life um, if you put those steps into practice. But that was my first book. Um, while I was in Accomack County, that was the former division I was part of, uh, I was also a anti-bullying coordinator. And I was looking for something that wasn't just another cookie cutter uh, type of anti-bullying program that you would buy off the shelf and, you know, try to make it fit uh, your school division or your population. So with that and with the, the, the passion, I decided I was going to write a book and create a curriculum from the book. And it was called Billy the Bull and the Buck Two Cipher. Cipher. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Just put it in Chester Hall and type Billy the Bull and it'll pop right up. But anyway, um, that was the start of a seven book series. Um, I'm about three books in. Uh, the first one's already been published. Um, actually, it was about two years ago, two, three years ago, that I published that one. And um, I'm actually working on those other two currently right now. Um, this is kind of, Black Flower's kind of taking a, a front seat, and those are taking a back seat as of right now. But, you know, anti-bullying is still a passion of mine. Um, I hate to see when kids uh, don't like coming to school or don't like coming to school. They don't like being around other kids or don't want to socialize because of the fear of being picked on or being harassed or being bullied. So the whole purpose behind it was to create a book. It is a graphic novel um, for middle grade level, six through eight. But, you know, I've given it to adults. I've given it to younger kids. They've read through it. Uh, the comic strips or the pictures inside of it are easy enough to read through the book, and I had to uh, read through that actual comic itself, or the, the words itself, um, easy to follow. And um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from it, a lot of good feedback. Um, this allowed me to travel um, up and down the East Coast. Um, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of different organizations, church groups, um, youth groups, uh, teachers, and I've actually become, you know, a trainer for my own division um, back in Accomack County. So it's been, you know, I've been very blessed with that. And like I said, there's only one book that I've put out. I've got two more that are in the oven, and hopefully bet between now and, I don't know, by the time I turn 45, 46, um, mm -hmm. I have the other four yeah. that are ready to go. <laughs> definitely, definitely. That's, uh, that's <laughs> it's really interesting because um, I've recently, I've been talking to my friends a lot, like, hey, man, like, I really want to write a book. Um, that's just something that's been really dwelling on my mind. And I actually have a con I had a conversation with, uh, a lady yesterday, uh, she was an author up in New York, 
And um, we were just like talking about um, pretty much like her journey of how she first she wrote her first book. And um, for me, it's it's been something that I've been wanting to do for a little while. But I guess I've never really thought like, all right, what is I never really gave it much thought what it's going to be about um, and, and all that. So more recently, as I've just been like consuming a little bit more content, meeting a little bit more authors, I've been just right. learning like, I guess, kind of like the mindset of like, what do I want? What do I want the purpose to be? What do I want the end goal to be? What do I want people to get on the receiving end? Um, so I, I, I love how, you know, that, that's something that you're passionate about. You said anti-bullying. So it's like, all right, well, let me create, you know, a series, <laughs> not just one, but like a series, <laughs> you know, for that. So I definitely, I definitely respect that. Right. Yeah. So, um, Edom, do you have anything left or any other questions? Uh, no, just want to honestly wish you all the luck and I really applaud, <laughs> heavily applaud the anti-bullying, um, you know, no, series you're working on. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So you guys will be one of the first ones to know when the next one drops. Definitely. So. Definitely. We'll have to keep that on, we'll keep, keep that on deck. All right. Stop. So. Stop. Thank you uh, very much. So now we'll take a quick break. We'll go into our second segment of the quote of the day. And then our last segment, we'll get into Black Flower Apparel. So um, if you're on the live, just stay tuned. We'll, we'll have segment two rolling. <laughs> welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the second segment of today's episode. If you're on the live, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. We're here with uh, Chester Hall. We just had a great conversation about his background, education, uh, being an author, being a life coach. So now we're in, uh, about to do our quote of the day. So for this week, Edom has the quote. So what we got? All right. So the quote is, they say anything's possible. You got to dream like you never seen obstacles. Ooh, bars. Ooh. Bars. <laughs> You can put that on a shirt. <laughs> is that like Nas or something? <laughs> nah. I want to say I want to say kind of close, but nah, not Nas. Oh, Jay Z. Hip hopper. Okay. No, not Jay Z. Rapper though, but not Jay Z. What was Def? No, not that. Not that old. Allen says Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I said rapper, bro. I mean, I mean, he, 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 he says one. Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> Alan says Ice Cube. <laughs> nah, not Ice Cube. I, I can't even imagine Ice Cube saying something like that. Wait, can you say can you say it one more yeah, time? Yeah, spit it one more time. They say anything's possible. You got a dream like you never seen obstacles. They say anything is possible. You got a dream like anything. Uh, I don't know. That's the that's a popsicle stick, right? You know, anything what? is possible, I popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> Diddy? No. Are you going to be upset when you don't get this? Uh, is it old school or new school? Yeah. Uh, I mean... Uh, uh, yeah. Decade. J. Decade. Cole? Decade. What? J. Cole? Yeah. J. Cole? I'm really biased, man. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I got you. Kind of fits. You know, you're, you're an educator. You know, you're also really you know, uplifting kids and everything. It kind of fits. It's something you tell a kid. No, 100%. Yes. Can you say it one more time? Yes. Uh, they say anything's possible. You got a dream like you've never seen obstacles. No, that's a that's a fact. You have to... I think it's really funny. I had this prepared for last week, and I'm using it now. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, definitely. I, I, I like that because um, it kind of goes back to the topic of fear that we bring up often. Um, you know, a lot of people don't start. A lot of people don't continue maybe because they're afraid. And, you know, you have to, you know, have that mindset that you know you're not gonna have you knowing you will have obstacles but don't focus on the obstacle itself right don't focus on the problem because the problems will come up that's life right storms will always happen problems will come up this is an example of what we're going through now you know what i mean problems will come up but it's not necessarily don't focus on the problem focus on the solution or focus on you know how to, or the end goal right and then that way you're driven that no matter what you know, you're not going to let the obstacles stop you. Shout out Mitchell for joining. But you're not going to um, you're not going to let the obstacles prevent you from succeeding and moving forward. So I, I like yeah. that. Yes. I mean, it's one of those things, like you said, as far as speaking about fear, that that, that personally, that's what holds a lot of people back from doing what it 
as they want to do. Like right now, I'm looking on IG and I see so many people that are talking about, you know, you've got all this time to yourself now. If you don't come out wiser or invested in something or, you know, a business plan, then you lack, you know, you procrastinate, you, you lack vision, you lack a, a hope possibility. And I think that's true. I think that that major thing is that fear that, you know, what if this doesn't happen? You know, what if what if I lose all my money? Okay, then you learn from it, you bounce back, you keep moving. Um, the biggest thing, I actually put it on Facebook uh, maybe about a week ago or two weeks ago, and I said, you know, you know, investing in stocks right now is so simple. You know, there used to be this huge gate um, this huge barrier, like you were talking about, to getting into stock trading and you know bonds and ETFs and stuff of that nature. But now with apps like Robinhood, you can come in with like pennies, like literally change, uh, one dollar, five, ten dollars, and actually invest in a company. And right now, when the market is down, you're able to get some of these blue chip stocks for like almost literally pennies on the dollar. And I, I told people, I was like, look. I don't care if you run with me or not, but millionaires are made in recessions and depressions. So if you've got a little bit of change, I mean, if you've got five, 10, 20, if you've got 50 bucks right now to spare, you know, go and play around in something. You've got 50 bucks. You don't have you don't have to worry about losing that 50. If you lose it, OK, yeah. I lost 50 bucks. You know, I'm not eating out for the next two weekends. Big deal. All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, once this is all said and done, once COVID is gone, you know, over the next two, three, five years, the recession is going to be gone. You know, we're going to be bouncing back from this, and there's going to be some manners made. I mean, they're not going to let these airline companies die. You yeah, know? yeah. Coke is not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> um, and then there's all these other companies, these energy companies that are, you know, two, three, four, five dollars. Don't be, don't be scared. Just you know, jump in. You know, yeah. if you if you lose it, okay, you learn the lesson. It's not the lesson is you know, don't invest again. It's like no, do your research. Yeah, you yeah. Know, look at some, you know, find out what it is that you want to do or you want to invest in and research it, and then put your money back in, and then you'll come back, you know, stronger, wiser, and hopefully a little bit more financially freer. No, that's a hundred percent. It's funny that you bring that up because I recently had a conversation with one of my mentors about investing in stocks. Because I was saying, um, you know, I've I've invested uh, a good amount in the past, but you kind of like slow down. But I'm like, all right, I need to get back into it. So we were just having like mm -hmm. a talk about it, and um, also I just been following a little bit more um, people on Instagram, and um, kind of just talking about that re the the research portion and regarding um, the money. One thing that we, uh, we, me and my mentor, we were saying that it's important that when you invest, you invest with your side money, right? And not that money that you need to eat with, right? It's not money right. that's like, you know, you, you need to hold on, but money that you're saying, you know what, I'm willing to lose this. Like if I don't, like right. you said, like, all right, granted, I don't eat for the next two weeks. Like it's not a big deal, right? So that takes the emotion out of it. One, because it's not money that you need to eat with. That helps to separate the emotion and that way, you know, then that's step one and then step two is that when you when it comes to doing research um it's not just okay um okay stocks are falling now let me just buy 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 right so that, that sounds right. easy and even myself i know i made a video um saying it's a good time to invest and it's important that um you also the important part is not just like let me invest and let me just do this like without you know any knowledge you have to do your research right so right. um there are a lot of people right now who are giving out a lot of free tips on like you know right now is an important time to invest because it kind of exposes what companies are good and what companies are bad and i saw a post today talking about like debt to income ratio this is a little bit stocks talk but this is a good so like it was like debt to income ratio long story they were saying that like you know companies that are in deep in debt they're for example they're the ones who like yeah their stocks may go down and they're not a company you may want to invest in because they're they're about to go bankrupt no but then right. you may have bigger companies, for example, Apple. Yeah, they're, maybe their stocks went down also. But if you look at their research and you see they're built already for to survive times like this, right? So those are a little bit research things that you have to know before you invest. Um, but that all ties back to obstacles, right? So, you know, ties back to maybe an obstacle was you didn't know about stocks, right? So now you have to, boom, like you have to use this time to take advantage and learn and do your research and things like that, so... That's it. That's it. That's really important. You know, I'm sorry, man. No, no, I was gonna say, yeah, go ahead. Oh um, no, it's, it's interesting that you brought up the whole the emotional aspect of it, as far as you know, doing your research and not being tied to it emotionally. It's funny because um, my son, I have my uh, my app on my phone, on my uh, 
on my front screen of my phone. And um, he was, I was checking my stocks one time, and I was looking at it, and I was looking at everything in red. And it was like one day last week, I think it was like a Thursday or Friday, and like the whole entire market just bottomed out. So anyway, he was like, what are you looking at? I was like, I'm checking my stocks to see what's going on. He was like, everything's red. I was like, yeah. He was like, aren't you scared? I was like, no. <laughs> he was like, I'm not. And I said, well, you know, basically, I have a portfolio right now that, you know, if one is kind of, you know, bad right now, I've got other stocks that have balanced it back out. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, you want to make sure you diversify. He's, he's 12, he'd be 13 in July. Yeah. And, um, but pretty much having a conversation with them. And then I said, you know, just pay attention. I was like, I want you to watch this. I was like, it was like maybe 12, one o'clock. I was like, after lunchtime, I guarantee you they'll come back up. So some of them did come back up. Some of them stayed down through the weekend, which was fine. But anyway, I said, you know, it's going to be a seesaw effect, you know, what you have to do is pay attention to the news. You have to read the newspaper. You have to pay attention to what's going on in the government. You got to make sure you pay attention to what's going on in the economy and the world. I was like, COVID right now is throwing everything out of whack. I was like, so from day to day, it's going to be fluctuating. So now when we're doing homework and we're sitting, he's sitting beside me because we're all doing homeschool right now. Um, mm -hmm. So he's looking like when I pick up my phone and I look, he's looking, Dad, are your stocks green or red? And I was like, they're green, man. It's cool. It's green. Like, Dad. Dad, your stocks are red. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. I was like, no, what am I going to do? What what should I do? Yeah. So I've got, got him into the aspect of, you know, what should I, what should he do? Or, you know, and I said, hey, go look up uh, the Coca-Cola, see what's going on. I was like, should I pull up? Should I put more in? And so now he's getting into that whole aspect. Yeah. But you can't be afraid to, you know, play around with this after doing some research. You can't have that emotional tie to it. Once again, it is that side money that you don't need, you know, to, you know, pay your electric bill next week. Um, this is money that if you lose it, okay, it's not a huge loss. And, you know, I know a lot of people out there are playing lottery and scratch-offs. Just consider this your, your lottery scratch-off money. Yeah. So if you didn't play a lottery for like a whole month, and you had that $30 or so, and I know people that spend more than a dollar every day, you know, this is that money that you could play around with. So definitely, definitely. So Edom, do you have any points? Uh, I guess to think back on everything you said, uh, the biggest, your biggest enemy, and honestly, kind of the biggest price driver is the unintelligent investor. You know, some days the market will be up, so you'll see a lot of people. You know, buy, 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 buy. And then it tanks the next day, and then they sell, 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 and boom, they right. money. So. That's the biggest price driver and your biggest enemy. So definitely do your research before you go and uh, blindly invest. Definitely, definitely. So to tie this all back to the quote, Ian, could you say it one last time? <laughs> <laughs> they say anything's possible. You got to dream like you've never seen obstacles. All right. So you can take that with you to the bank, right? So uh, that was the urban, urban legend, J. Cole. All right, so, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> on that note, we'll take another quick break, and then we're heading to our last segment. We'll talk talk about Black Flower Apparel. Um, yes. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. What's up, everyone? What's up? Welcome back to segment three of the Everybody Eats podcast. We're here with Chester Hall. And if you're on the live, you just overheard a little bit what we're about to get into for segment three. So that's the benefit of hopping on the live. You get to hear the stuff early and a little bit of the behind the scenes. So um, Black Flower Apparel, right? So that yes. is your clothing line. So let's talk about it. Um, you're wearing your shirt. And it's really interesting that you had that reef. Edom and I, we'll talk a little bit later about how with that, those, those leaves, that's, that's actually pretty crazy. But um, what what is it? How'd you start? What is it about? Alright, so Black Flower Apparel was my quest into myself, I guess you could say. It was like a personal project. Yeah. Um I actually started working on Black Flower at the same time that I was kind of moving away from uh Billy the Bull, I guess you could say. So one project kind of replaced the other, should I say. Um when I moved from the Eastern Shore of Virginia to Newport News, you know, this was kind of like a, a soul searching kind of thing because, you know, I was kind of, you know, building upon myself. You know, it was kind of me leaving the nest of the Eastern Shore because, you know, that's where I lived most of my life and kind of going out and doing something new, should I say. Yeah. Um, Black Flower was the hybrid of three or two or three, two or three different things. One, I wanted to learn more about black history. You know, the history that they don't teach you in school, should I say. Yeah. Um, 
we don't as as a people we don't teach our our, our children our youth um, enough about who we are as individuals or as, as individuals as well as a people um, and a lot of that is because you know we're bombarded with other things but at the same time it's so scattered I guess you could say we're we're all over the country we're all over the world and there's a lot of misinformation there's a lot of information I think we're constantly as a people searching for who we are mm. um, so that's part of the process of me creating Black Fire was it gave me the opportunity to do research on myself and my people as a whole and I wanted to do some traveling so therefore you know I wanted to travel to these uh, foreign places that are in my own country that are in my own backyard that I've never been to or never been exposed to or never seen um, there's a lot of history out there that I've yeah. never heard of before um, and that's kind of what Black Fire was all about is to tap into the obscure history that nobody really knows about or hasn't really heard about that much. So the quest of one, the quest for self, um, exploring black history, I wanted to create a line, uh, I wanted to create something, a product that was as close to 100% black owned, black operated, black developed as possible. Um, when you look up at the top of it, it says 100% all natural. So that was the whole quest was to get to a product that I could say was 100%. Um, it's hard. It is very hard. Um, there's a author uh, right now. Or there's an author. I think her book is called The Black Year or My, My Black Year. And I can't remember her name, but she talks about how she tried to go and shop completely black. And it was almost impossible to do so. I mean, as far as gas stations, uh, cleaners, grocery, um, it was hard to do so. So now she's, you know, within that book, she's talked about, you know, if, the, if it's available, then I will. But if it's not, then you have to do what, what you have available to you. Um, and that's kind of what this product was about. I wanted to see how many times I could circulate the black dollar in black flower. Um, so as of... Let me see, as of maybe about three months ago, no, I'm in December, should I say, I'm able to say I have a 100% black apparel line. Um, I have one shirt that's about to be printed. Um, shout out to Lex Fresh to the screen printing at Newport News. Um, shout out to Seed to Shirt. And that's a little secret there, so mm -hmm. I want everybody to flood Seed to Shirt right now. I just gave you guys the resource. If you're on the live Seed to Shirt, definitely shout out to them. Shout out to that. Um, seed to Shirt. Seed to Shirt. Um, Real good stuff. Yes. Um, she. Her name is Tamika Peoples, and I, ta I tapped into her around about 2018. And I searched. I just searched. I was looking for an apparel manufacturer that created um, T-shirts and hats and stuff like that that was from not just a black owned, black operated, but black developed. In other words, everything is black, vertically integrated from top to bottom. Um, Tamika created a product for, called Seed to Shirt where she sources um, cotton from black farmers. And if it's not from black farmers, it's from African farmers. So when you have a shirt in your hands, it has, to, it has come from a black farmer, um, either stateside or overseas. And then her company is processing that. And what she has is her shirt and her shirt line. She has it in pockets um, as well as blank fronts. And then she has black, white, and gray, I believe. Um, but ultimately, I said, I want your shirt. Well, 2018, it was like October 2018. She's like, I'm not ready yet. I was like, okay, whenever you're ready, you need to call me. And she contacted, well, she wasn't ready yet. I contacted her about a year later, around about October 2019. And I said, are you ready? She was like, yes, I'm ready. I was like, cool, set me up with what you got. I was like, I don't care how much it costs. You have what I need to make a completely 100% black line. And she was like, okay. So according to her, I was her first part, first part of her campaign. I had the first sale, mm. and it was only 25 shirts. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the whole process behind it was to create that product line, and I'm actually having it printed up right now. Um, but the main thing is, is that I wanted to just circulate that dollar. So it's a black shirt. I created the design. Lexpress and Screen Printing is a black uh, screen printer in Newport News. Um, I had patches from Patch Party Club in Chicago, I believe. She developed the patch. I do have a patch. I'm going to show that to you right now. Let's go. Let's see. And that's what it looks like right there. I like there. that. I like that. I like that. Okay. So she created that. Big shout out to Patch Party Club. And um, she developed that. And then there's a company in downtown Newport News. Um, it's called World Class Solutions. Uh, we'll make world class marketing, but world class, I know that much. Um, big contractor with Newport News Shipyard. And um, she 
does she sewed them on for me or her company Sharon Owens she owns the company but her seamstress actually sewed the patches on so the whole entire the shirt whole operation Texas, the, the whole, whole operation <laughs> black op, black owned black operated yeah. so I'm able to put on this shirt that this shirt is 100% black owned um, and that's the whole niche behind what I was looking for because there are people out there that are willing to purchase products that have maybe a black design, but did that black design come from a black designer? Mm-hmm. Um, there are people out there that have t-shirts that are that, that represent black power, but was that t-shirt manufactured by a black person? You know, the tagging, the labeling, everything. So my mission was to get as close to that as possible. And like I said, as of December, I was successful. So now I'm in the process of actually putting that all together to get that out. Hopefully, after COVID, I can get it all squared away yeah. um, and get it out to the people. So definitely, definitely, that's that's powerful. I love I love hearing that collaboration. I love seeing that. Um, that reminds me of I don't know if you've seen um, uh, Killer Mike. He had a, a, a ten. I think it's like a little document, not really a documentary or a show. Like ten episodes he put out on Netflix, and on one of the episodes. Um, essentially he was, I'm pretty sure he was traveling in Atlanta and he was trying to live like three days, like all right. black, all hundred percent black. And if Eden, I know, I mean, Eden was there, but, um, while we were in, in, in school, we had, um, a black history event and we actually showed that episode and then we had a discussion about, uh, with that episode. So okay. Eden, you want to say something? Yeah, it was really you know, funny and interesting because he really could not do anything and he, yeah. he was in Atlanta too, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. really like it's kind of funny you think like you know, I, I associate Atlanta with black culture, a lot of rap artists, hip hop. So he really thinks you know, black business would really be a, a hot spot there, but he could not do anything. He couldn't even find a, a black drug dealer. He said so. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was <laughs> like not find he couldn't even because he was like he was like even if the product itself is black, he was like who grew it. And then they were like, ah, he couldn't right. do it there. So it was like he couldn't go to like the market. He, he couldn't do that. He couldn't do anything. So um, it's I, I definitely commend you for <laughs> for having the whole operation like that. Yeah, it's that's why it's taking me so long, man. I mean, and you know, I I look at people's shirts and I look at people's apparel and I was like, man, I want to just go ahead and push mine out right now. But it's like, ah, I just gotta that willpower. You yeah. gotta hold, you gotta refrain and. You know what you want. You know what the brand is all about. You know what you're looking for. So therefore, you refrain from doing so. So I will say that not every shirt that I have, or not all the apparel, is black owned, black operated. Um, it's it's above ninety percent, I will say. But the one shirt that I got, um, like I said, the line that I got that's based on um, seat to shirt, that one will be one hundred percent. So and yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. Yes. Yes, America. Yes, international. It's gonna cost a little bit more to shop black. Yeah. <laughs> okay? They don't have the feet. They don't have the legs like Walmart. They yeah. don't have the legs like a Target. Yeah. They don't have legs like a Kroger. It's gonna cost you a little bit more, but at least you'll know that you're circulating that money inside your own community. Definitely, definitely. Deal with it. I love it. <laughs> hey, it's 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 a reality. You know what I mean? So we we had uh, we had an episode a couple weeks back. Uh, no discounts, honestly, you know, and we were yes. talking about like, you know, if you're really a supporter, um, you're, you're not going to, if you're a true supporter of someone, you're not going to always ask for a discount or, you know, oh, what's my price? That's like when we had Corey on the episode, he was like, Jamaicans love to say, what's my price? So, right. So, <laughs> right. So it's not going to be like that. Right. So like, shout out to my family, my cousin, Stephanie, she was, I don't know if she's still in here, but, um, she was probably my, one of my first customers and she's been one of my biggest supporters. She's family, but she's always paying full price, like no right. discounts or anything. And like, that's love, you know, and that's how you truly support. So um, it's, it's, that's, that's what it is. You know, you, you have to be willing to spend, spend that money. It's going to be a little bit, maybe it's going to cost you a little bit more, but the money is going to, it's going to mean more. You know what I mean? It's not right. going to be, um, it, it's going to mean more, you know? So um, yeah, we love that. We love that. So Edom, do, do you have anything, do you have anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Uh, I guess maybe uh, the whole black on black, 100% black, I really, like Benson said, commend you and applaud it because it really, it, it's really hard to think about the levels of it because, you know, on the surface you think, all right, this is my business. 
I made this, like, you know, I designed this shirt, but, you know, you think about who's printing it off of the shirt, who, you know, where the shirt comes from. So that, that's, it takes a lot, I think, discipline and, and thought and, 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 I guess, intentionality. Uh, that's not a real word, but, you know, you have to be really, <laughs> you know, intentional about it. There we go. So I really, uh, really, really applaud you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and it, like I said, it's hard. Um, I just put an order in for uh, 500 uh, labels because I'm doing some relabeling on some of the new shirts. Um, and I talked to one of the vendors to deal with, and she told me that she was going to be about, you know, three to four weeks out. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm trying to get these out now. Yeah. So I did have to go somewhere else. And But, you know, I still plan to come back to her to get my patches and stuff like that. So it's, it's not necessarily that I'm abandoning one business for another it's i need this right now but i still got you on the side for those special things that i need to get done um so yeah i mean you do what you got to do and yeah and all the other thing is it's not a knock on other you know ethnicities other you know races or anything else like that this is just you know like i said it's a product that i wanted to see how far i could get into the black community as far as circulating those dollars and yeah there's a goal that you had, you know what I mean? You said yeah, you wanted to and that's you it. did it. So that's 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 yeah. definitely amazing. So we actually have a question from the live. Um, Alan says, um, you mentioned that you had to wait before you release your clothing line. What did it feel like having to put that on pause? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a little bit. And you know what? It's, I, I don't have a clothing background. I don't have an apparel background or anything else like that. Um, once again, this is me kind of learning, like I said, about myself and learning about the apparel industry altogether. Um, so even with the first uh, line that I put out, um, or the first shirt that I put out, it's called, um, uh, excuse me, it's called Royal Flush. And it's got uh, Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Harriet Tubman, and Booker T on the back of it on a set of cards. And, um, you know, even me designing that in um, Illustrator, you know, and then carrying it to somebody to get screen printed. Well, you know, they were talking about, you know, this is going to be this amount of colors and, you know, this amount of colors is going to take this much amount of money. So therefore, I started looking into uh, direct to garment and then I, you know, took the direct to garment. They were all black shirts and the, the inks are water based and they suck into the shirt. Opposed to, it was crazy. So even the first shirt. I mean, by the head, it's a banging shirt. <laughs> but even the first shirt that I produced, and I looked at it, and I looked at the shirts that I've made up until now, and I'm like, wow, I, wish, I really wish I knew then what I knew now, but it's about growth. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a headache. It's, it's a headache and a heartache having to wait to put something out that you want to. But, you know, that's why it's a side hustle, not my, my primary as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if it was my primary, I probably would be going in a different direction. Um, because, like I said, this is just a side business, and it's not my bread and butter. It's the side hustle. So if it takes a little while longer, so be it. But um, yeah, I, I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to sacrifice what the product line was all about just to make that dollar. Got gotcha, you, so. got gotcha. So um, I was gonna say, like, even I, we, we know that fairly well. Just like dropping different lines and making designs, pretty much about like, you know. <laughs> the complications that go from putting a design on a shirt like it seems so easy sometimes like oh just put a design on a shirt like now there's a lot of like little things that go into it that make it you know that take, makes it take a little bit more time so it's funny that you oh yeah yeah <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that but the, we, designing uh, it is the easiest part yeah honestly i mean yeah for, for us it's been like design's been the easiest part and then it's been like every step after like once you save the file Every step after, every step after is like, that's like a whole journey in itself. So, right. um, but yeah, that's a, that's a whole episode when we talk about clothes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I mean, I've even looked at designing myself and when I looked at it, I was like, you know, is this going to rock? Can I, can I, would I rock this or yeah. could, is this going to sell? And like even one of the shirts that I um, just had printed, um, I, I, I kind of had reservations about it, but yeah. I knew what it is I wanted it to do. Like, um, it's Black Braille. That's the name of the shirt. It's called Black yeah. Braille. So I saw you posted it on uh, Instagram. Yeah, yeah, so when you look at the shirt straight on, you can't see the, the ink that's printed on it because it's all in black um, puffy ink. It's yeah. Braille. Um, so actually, if you go up and you can shine light on it, you could actually see it. Or if you, you know, touch it, you can see it. Yeah. But and I'm not going to tell you what it says because then that gives away the whole premise. Yeah. But, you know, that's almost like I designed that more or less for me because I thought it was a really good idea. Yeah. 
is it gonna, is it a good idea that somebody else is going to rock it? Yeah. And then I had to kind of compare it to all the kanji and all the, the Japanese and Chinese script that I see on t- people's shirts, not knocking it, but I don't know what that says. I don't, it, it, you, can, you got your name over top of it, and I can only assume that that's what your name means, but it could mean, you know, go to H, you know, as far as we really know. And I wanted something that I knew for a fact I would be able to read or somebody else that they really wanted to read it, they could decipher it as well. Um, it's just braille writing. You know, you can look it up. It's a font. You can look it up and actually see what it reads. But, you know, that as a design on a shirt, would somebody rock with that? So, you know, like you said, the design process is easy. The other stuff behind it is like, okay, was this the right move? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I have really done that? So, yeah, but nah, it so is what it is. I want to I wanna say one last point, and then I want to go... Uh, we're probably going to have to do one more one more segment just to finish up the conversation. So one last <laughs> point. When you say that, that brings me back to, for Kilty, we have designs where some of our earliest uh, designs um, are in Haitian Creole, they're in a different language. And the point of Kilty is that we're embracing and bringing all these cultures together. I'm, my background is from Haiti, so I understand what it means. But one of our certs say Sakat Fet. Sakat Fet is another, say, uh, what's, another way to say what's up in Haitian Creole. And we've had people who are Haitian and not Haitian buy the shirt because it looks cool. And I've had people message me saying, oh, what does that mean? And to me, that was the greatest satisfaction because that was the point of Kilti. I want you to ask those questions. What does that mean? If you don't know what it is, ask a question, you'll learn, right? And it's to educate and inspire. So once you say that, that like that's what it takes me back to. Like that's the whole <laughs> the whole point of Kilti is like maybe you don't understand it, but ask that question. You know what I mean? Be right. a little bit curious. And like, it, you don't necessarily have to be part of the culture to rock the shirt. You know, that's the beauty of bringing multi, uh, multiple cultures together. So, right. um, no, for, for those who haven't heard the mission of Kilty, that's the mission of Kilty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're gonna wrap up this segment and then we have to do one last one. I still wanna ask that question, what advice would you give to a sixth grader or just a student, we could say. Um, so we'll ask that, we'll do that last segment and then wrap up the episode. So if you're watching on the live, stay tuned. What's up, everyone? If you're on the live, thanks for joining the live. Actually, might cut off in a few. Um, looks like we're about to hit that hour, but we'll see how much we get. Anyway, we are on segment four of today's episode. We're here with Chester Hall. Um, we just had a great conversation about uh, Black Flower Power, his background, J. Cole quote. So now we're getting to this last segment where um, early in the episode I posed a question. What advice would you give? I want to get posed two questions. What advice would you give to a sixth grader right now to prepare them for the future since that's the grade that you said you taught? And then after I want to ask you what advice would you give, I would say college students since that's probably my, more my target market. So what advice would you give either a high school student or a college, like a senior or a college student um, you know, prepping, prepping for, for the world after. So let's start with a sixth grader since that was the, the first grade that you taught. Okay. All right. So, and, and if it sounds very similar to each other, it, it was intentional because the advice kind of worked for both groups. Um, learn. I mean, just, you need to have two different skill sets or you need to have, so you might take that back. You need to have three different skill sets. You need to have the education they're teaching you in school. You need to have the education that you're learning from outside of school, and you need a skill. You need a skill. You have to have a skill. So anything they're teaching you in one school, great. Use it. Apply it. Do what you have to do with it. The education that you learn outside of school is to become more valuable to you than what you're learning in school. Could you elaborate on that? Are you, are you, uh, yeah. Is that like street sure, smarts? Sure. or? <laughs> It's not even necessarily street smarts, and if you want to even add street smarts in there, that'd be a fourth one. Um, what I'm saying the education out of school is, once again, the history of yourself, of your culture. You're not going to learn that history um, in school, at least you know, unless you take an African American studies class. Um, and I don't even believe they have a lot of those at the high school level, either at middle school level. Um, but at the same time, you know, those those things that you could learn about yourself, you need to learn, okay? Because that makes you uh, a more prideful, a much an individual that has more pride in self. Um, as you walk down the street, as you walk through the halls, if you knew for a fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Matthew Henson was one of the individuals that went to the North Pole, or first African American to the North Pole, led explorers to the North Pole, looked like an absolute African American, was an African American, excuse me, a black person, you 
probably hold yourself a little bit higher as you're walking down the street. If you knew that you, your ancestors were kings and queens of Africa, you would hold your head a little bit higher. Um, you know, there's a, a great clip of a kid that was a basketball player. His head was down after he missed a shot, and the guy came over and lifted his head yeah, up real yeah. quick. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, love that, love that, love that. Um, but not only that, you know, languages. You know, there's no reason right now that you should not have at least a second or even a third language under your belt, at least in the process. While I'm in this uh, quarantine right now, I thought to myself, you know what, I need to learn Kiswahili, okay? Not necessarily because I need it, but, you know, as as far as the black populace, it was, it was deemed that in order to unify us as a people, we need to have one unified language. And it was deemed back in, I believe, in the 50s or the 60s, you know, earlier than that, um, Marcus Garvey, um, it was deemed, UNIA, that Kiswahili is the language of black people, that we need to have that. So therefore, I picked up Kahoot, not Kahoot, excuse me, um, the little owl thing, Duolingo, um, picked that up and just started taking notes and learning. Kiswahili. Um, you need to have this have this education outside of school as well. Third thing, you need a skill. Okay, learn to build something, learn to program something, learn to code something, learn something that is not going to be necessarily you know in a classroom setting per se. Learn how to do plumbing. Learn how to do HVAC. Learn how to do electrical work. Learn a skill because not only does that help you in your life right now, but it also will help you if you decide to go to college. It'll help you pay for college. So therefore, you can work while you're going to college. That's why I said this kind of applies to the college mm -hmm. student as well. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, and then street smarts. I don't have a lot of street smarts. But I have more book smarts than street smarts. <laughs> but <laughs> but the main thing is, is that, you know, everybody is not your friend. You know, and you, we meet people as we're going down through life. Some people are there for a reason. Some people are there for a season. Yeah. So you have to determine who those individuals are. Rock with those that are with you and those that aren't you leave to the side. So yeah, you want to add all those different educations in there, then by all means. To the college student, take that and then add one more. Don't knock your first job. Mm. Okay. If somebody's willing to give you a job, you take it. Mm. <laughs> okay. It's hard out here right now. It is about to get even harder. Okay. Yeah. The whole this COVID nineteen thing has changed the whole face of the earth. Mm. Nothing is going to be sane from here on out. So the the future that they were telling you about that hasn't come yet, that they're preparing you for, it's here now. Yeah. Information, the information age, that's about to come to an end, and we're about to go to a whole nother level. And by all means, it's not going to be, you know, sitting at a physical place anymore. It's probably going to be in front of a computer. Yeah. So need to get as much exposure and experience. Take that first job, learn the skills, get the ideas, and then use that to apply to something else. Definitely. I've, I've received that pretty much similar advice not too long ago so i love i love hearing it again it reinforces <laughs> reinforces that so um thank you that that definitely elaborates um on that question so Edom, do you have anything you want to uh conclude with uh no um but definitely i think the way you've st structured your answers the first i've ever heard in that way so thank you for that again um that third skill, I don't think, I never, I never grew up being told that. It kind of just came along the way, and um, in my journey, it was through you know business and getting involved in, like Bensky said, NABA and everything. But if I, if my sixth grade self could hear that now, I'd probably be in a way different position than I am right now. So definitely, I hope you're. Well, I know you are spreading the word to as many uh, young kids as you can, but I really.
Christ.